We will be opening our scriptures to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to look at verses uh, 17 through 20. And this is going to be a two-part sermon. Let's go ahead and uh, look at the title. Uh, Matthew 5, we're going to look at 17 through 20. And I've titled this first part of the sermon, The Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. The Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. We'll break this section into two pieces next week, or the week after. Next week, we'll listen to uh, Ron Hill, and I'm looking forward to that. That'll be a blessing. You guys will get to hear somebody other than me. Uh, but the week after that, then we'll come back and we'll look at Matthew 5, 17 through 20 again. And we'll exposit the text uh, at that time. So let's just go ahead and read it for now. Verse 17 do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Verse 19, Therefore whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. I don't know if you've ever thought about how important it is. How do we understand the law, the prophets, and the Psalms? The first 39 books of the Bible. <clears throat> it actually turns out to be very important how we understand those things because uh, the question is, uh, are there aspects of those first 39 books of the Bible, are there laws in there that we are still under today or not? Are the prophecies in those first 39 books of the Bible already fulfilled or are we waiting for them to be fulfilled? This is a, actually ends up being a great big discussion in the churches, and it actually separates the churches over this understanding. So that's what we'll do today is we'll come to our conclusion about the nature of these first 39 books of the Bible. Let me just give you just a couple examples of how an understanding of the Old Testament can cause divisions in the churches today. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church, uh, they are taught that they are still under aspects of the old law. They are still required to keep the dietary laws of Leviticus chapter 11. They are told that they are still required to keep those old Jewish dietary laws. They are also told that they are still under the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, most uniquely and importantly, the fourth commandment, which was you should keep the Sabbath day holy. They are taught that you have to worship on Saturday, that you have to keep the Sabbath. They are also taught that anybody that does not keep the Sabbath, those of us that worship on Sundays, are breaking the Ten Commandments and more importantly than there, uh, if you worship on a Sunday, it's an indicator that you have already received the mark of the beast in Romans, I mean, in Revelation chapter 13. That's their indicator. Anybody that worships on Sunday has received the mark of the beast. And so you can see how a bad understanding of the Old Testament, not knowing exactly uh, when it finished or if it has finished, leads to all kinds of difficulties. Uh, when you roll it out even further, they are concerned. Uh, probably the most famous Seventh-day Adventist is Ben Carson. I don't know if you knew he was Seventh-day, but they are concerned that one day America will make a Sunday law. They are teaching that when America makes a Sunday law that everybody has to worship on Sunday, that that's going to start Armageddon and that's going to start the end of the world. <clears throat> In other ways that things can get uh, turned about is what we call futurism. Uh, there are actually the majority of Protestant faiths today believe in futurism. What does that look like? Well, 
If you've ever heard of the Left Behind movie series, the book series Left Behind, that there's going to be a rapture, uh, righteous people are going to be taken, uh, the world's going to be left behind, then there's going to be a thousand, I mean, a uh, great tribulation, then Jesus is going to come reign on earth. All of that stuff comes from what's called future ism. And what that means is lots of denominations don't believe that the prophecies of the Old Testament, the first 39 books, they have not been fulfilled. The promises that God made in the Old Testament, they believe have not been kept. So they are teaching that all the promises and the prophecies of the Old Testament, many of them are still in the future. They haven't happened yet. That's called futurism. So what I'd like to do today before we exposit the text, we'll do that in part two, but I want to make it very clear. I want to equip you guys with an understanding of the Old Testament. Is any of it still bearing today? Is it completely finished? Are the prophecies fulfilled yet, or are there some prophecies that still need to happen? And I want you to be very clear about that by the end of today's sermon. Our text starts us off by saying, if we go back and look at our text, it starts us off by Jesus saying about three things that we want to keep track of. He said, number one, in Jesus' day, when Jesus was teaching in His generation... It's important that we keep track of the timeline when we study these things. In Jesus' day during His life to His generation, Jesus said the law and the prophets still need to be fulfilled. He said not one dot or iota will disappear until it's all accomplished. And thirdly, it would be wrong to relax any of the commandments until everything is fulfilled. So as of Jesus' teaching in Matthew, it's not fulfilled yet. They are still under the law, and there are still prophecies that need to happen. But we want to find out from Scripture in our day, by our lifetime, does anything still need to be fulfilled? Does anything still need to happen? And is there any aspect of the law that we are still under? Or was it already completed at some point during Jesus' generation? That's the conclusion we want to come to. So let's just wrap our mind around the first 39 books. First 39 books are often called the law, the prophets. Uh, sometimes it's even called the law, the prophets, and the psalms. So you'll want to remember that. And the easiest way to grab a hold of that is that from the beginning of Genesis, the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms were all some kind of eschatologic ideas that were being promoted. Things that were starting way back then, but the things that would evolve and unroll until they finally were completed. So you don't want to think of the Old Testament as, oh yeah, that's an old law that God gave and then it didn't work, so God quit it and gave a brand new law. You don't want to think of two static things. You want to picture the first 39 books as slowly evolving into the New Testament. I think one of the easiest ways to picture it is in the Old Testament, we see God's salvific plan for mankind in its infancy as a baby. And then it had to grow up, it had to mature, it had to become a teenager uh, through the prophets, you might say. And then in Christ, it finally became what God always wanted it to be, what God intended for it to be from the beginning. So in Christ, you have the fulfillment. So I, I guess our word is metamorphosis. What started out as a, a, a caterpillar has now turned into a butterfly. I would prefer to see that instead of something old that, that didn't work and is done, something new that's better, I prefer to see it as it was. we're introduced to this caterpillar all the way back in the very first pages of Genesis. And then we watch that caterpillar evolve. And then at some point in the New Testament, in the time of Christ, that caterpillar changed, metamorphosized into what God had always been planning, this butterfly. 
Uh, let's look at some of the stuff uh, in those first 39 books to show that it was always a plan that was unraveling little by little. Let's go all the way back to the first pages. The first pages of Genesis. When man sinned, God's plan immediately went into action. When men broke God's laws and were no longer allowed to dwell in the presence of God, God already says, I'm going to send a person to fix this problem. So let's look at it. Genesis 3.15, He will crush your head and you will strike His heel. That already sets in motion God's eschatologic plan of revealing things a little at a time until someone comes to crush the head of Satan. Part two, if we move forward a little bit, we see Moses going up on Mount Sinai. Moses is going to deliver laws down to Israel. But no sooner does Moses give Israel the laws of God, Moses, like a prophet, delivering God's laws to his people, no sooner does he does that, that the Scripture teaches, but one day I'm going to send another prophet. He will be like Moses. He will teach you the new things that I will give him to teach you. Let's look at that in Deuteronomy 18 and 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, that's like Moses, from amongst their brothers. I'll put my words in his mouth and he will speak to them everything that I command him. Verse 19, And whoever will not listen to my words that he will speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. If you want to cross-reference that, you can check Acts chapter 3. And Peter says, Jesus was the prophet like Moses that came to teach us God's commandments. Acts chapter 3. So instantly, what happens is everybody is terrified at the giving of the command of Moses. The mountain is on fire, there's lightning, there's fire, there's thunder. God is talking, and anything that misbehaves dies immediately. And that's a picture of the law of Moses. And the people said, quit telling us these things. Quit talking to us about God because we're absolutely terrified. We absolutely cannot handle what you're telling us. And that's a reference to the Mosaic law, the Torah. And so God says, it's good that they say this. It's good that they're terrified. So what I'm going to do, Moses, is your terrifying law is going to have a short purpose. But there's going to come a time where I'm going to send another prophet like you and he will reveal to the world my words. So you can already see that Moses' commandments were going to end at some point in the future. We're already being told that. When the new prophet comes and he speaks the new words that I command him to speak. Moses, you might look at, Moses' law was kind of like the caterpillar, but he was revealing that in, in the future there's going to be more that I want to reveal to my people. And when that new prophet like Moses comes to reveal this new teaching, that's going to be like the caterpillar now becoming the butterfly. That's going to be when my plan has been fully carried out, is what God says. There's many other aspects of the first 39 books that are all looking forward to God's plan unrolling, uh, developing the eschatology, the timeline. Let me give you a few of them where the Old Testament is always looking forward to this new thing that God is going to do. First, in Ezekiel chapter 36, God promised that one day I'm going to take away this heart of stone that prohibits people from being able to obey my commandments. I'm going to give people a heart of flesh and a brand new spirit. That's going to be something in the future. But Ezekiel announces that it is coming. Ezekiel 36 and verse 26, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. 
I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and I'll cause you to walk in my statutes and to be careful to obey my rules. All forward-looking stuff. In the book of Daniel chapter 2, we're told to expect a brand new kingdom that one day in the future, one day in the future, God is going to set up a brand new kingdom. This new kingdom in the New Testament gets called the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. But God is already letting everybody know one day I'm going to set up a new kingdom with new rules and a new king. We know who that is. Daniel chapter 2 and 44. In the days of those kings, he was speaking of the Roman Empire at that time, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will shatter all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, but will itself stand forever. This new kingdom with a new king and a new teaching, he says in Daniel 2, is going to be established not at some time in our future, sometime in Daniel's future, but he pointed out it will be established during the time of the Roman Empire. So we can be very clear that these predictions that are being looked forward to were being established by God's timeline during the time of the Roman Empire. That's what Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 make very clear to us. Uh, and that time he says, I'm going to also give you a brand new covenant. What was the old covenant? The old covenant was the Mosaic law. God says, here's the covenant. I will be your God. You will be my people. And here's the Mosaic law. Here's the rules that you need to follow in order for this covenant to work. But he's going to tell us, but you guys broke that covenant. Because of that, in the future, he says, I'm going to set up a brand new covenant and the old covenant will not be of any use to us anymore. Let's look at his promise to do that. Jeremiah, wow, did I not, did I skip verses? Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them out by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband. Now notice it's very important that we put a square. It's not going to be like the old covenant that I made with them. So when God's new covenant times comes with a new king, a new kingdom, during the time of the Roman Empire, he said the new covenant is going to replace the old covenant because it's not going to be the same. Let me go back to this one that I missed, Psalm chapter 2. If we're going to have a new kingdom, we're going to have a new king. And in Psalm chapter 2, he says, but it's not going to all be easy because the world at that time is going to set itself up against my king. The world is going to persecute the new king that I send. The kings and the rulers of that generation are going to persecute my anointed king, my anointed son. And he lets us know that ahead of time. Psalms chapter 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers all take counsel together against the Lord and His anointing. This new thing is not going to come with peace. This new thing is going to come with war and resistance and death. They're going to resist this new thing that I will set up in the future. Also, Habakkuk gave us another little glimpse into the future. Habakkuk chapter 2, uh, you know, in the... In, in the Torah, the people lived by what was called the written code. There was a written code that, that God gave them to live by, but Habakkuk already looked forward to a day when there would no longer be a written code. 
It would no longer be a written code. There would no longer be rituals. There would no longer be food laws. There would no longer be any of those things left over from the old covenant. But rather in this new covenant, people are going to live by faith is what Habakkuk tells us. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not right within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Habakkuk already announced a time, and we even saw it in Abraham, Abraham's faith. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. All of these were examples of what the new thing would look like. Faith and belief in God and in His Commandments. Well, can we pinpoint exactly when that faith came? We already have some of the old prophecies during the time of the Roman Empire, a new king, a new kingdom. But let's track down the word faith. When did this new faith that Habakkuk talked about first come on the scene? Let me take you over to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 23. Colossians, uh, they're going to tell us there in that letter that uh, we're no longer under the law and the prophets, under the Psalms, uh, because faith has now arrived. The faith is faith in Jesus Christ, faith in God's Messiah, faith in God's King, faith in Jesus' commandments and teachings, faith in His death, burial, and resurrection. That is the faith that Habakkuk was waiting for. Let's look at it. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law. We were imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. That's your answer. Are we still under those first 39 books? Are we still waiting for anything out of those first 39 books? Have, the, have we seen an end come to those first 39 books? Well, he tells you very clearly, those first 39 books were our guardian until Christ came. In order that we might be justified by faith, not by a written code. Verse 25, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For if in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. Clearly, by the writing of Colossians, we are no longer under the old law. We are no longer under that guardian. Now we are justified and made righteous by our faith in Jesus Christ, by our faith in His atoning sacrifice for the sins of mankind. Jesus, the Lamb of God, where the first 39 books required that men bring a lamb for the sacrifice for their sins. When Jesus came, we're told that, God, that Jesus was the Lamb of God, so we no longer have to offer lambs. The guardian, we are no longer under that guardian because in Jesus Christ, we are all sons of God through faith. There was a question during Jesus' time. It must have been a difficult time because Jesus is saying right now there are things that still need to be fulfilled. Jesus said that in His generation, things still need to happen. You still need to obey the law in Jesus' generation, He was saying. But they were curious. There was this overlap of time where Jesus was fulfilling the law. Jesus was doing all the things that the law required be completed. But during that time, notice that Jesus and His apostles, 
don't seem to behave the way the Pharisees expected people to behave under the old law. Why aren't Jesus and the apostles behaving the way the Pharisees expect them to behave? Let's look at it. He's going to tell us Matthew chapter 9 and verse 16. Why do Jesus and His apostles look different than the things that the law commanded? And He tells them, verse 16, No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will tear away from the garment and a worse tear will be made. Do you see what he's saying there? He's saying we act differently because if you have something old that is torn and you need to fix it, you can't put something brand new on something old and think that's going to fix it because when one of them shrinks, it's going to tear and ruin the whole thing. Hopefully we've got some sowers in here that might understand the idea. So Jesus in that little parable is recognizing there is something wrong with the old way. And the apostles and I are showing you the new way, but the new way and the old way are not compatible. The new way does not just patch up problems in the old way. They're not compatible. You can't overlay them. They can't work together. So what you have to do is you have to get rid of the old thing in order to have the new thing. Let's go on in the verse. He gives them a second example. Verse 17, neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins will burst and the wine will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. No, rather, new wine should be put into fresh wine skins. So both are preserved. The caterpillar is becoming the butterfly, but you don't force the butterfly to still look like the caterpillar. It's a brand new thing. The old thing is gone. The new thing is here. They won't look the same and they can't be mixed together. Number three, if we go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, he says, there is also no longer the Jew and the Gentile. That's another point of eschatology. There are many Protestant faiths that say, hey, the Jews are still a viable religion. They're still doing their thing. God still has a covenant with the Jews. They're still uh, progressing on God's, eschat God's eschatologic timeline. Someday God is going to give them Israel back. Someday God is going to build a third temple for them. And He's going to keep all these old covenants with the Jewish people. But what we're looking at is, no, Judaism uh, was the caterpillar that is now morphed into a butterfly. The two don't mix. So Judaism is now out of the picture and there is no future for them unless they come to Christ. Look at what he says here. Ephesians 2, 14-16. He Himself, he's talking about Jesus. He Himself is our peace who has made us both one. Who are the both? The Jew and the Gentile. Jesus came and changed Judaism and came and changed the Gentiles and made something that is brand new. He is our peace. He has made us both one and He has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility. The dividing wall of hostility was the Mosaic Law, the Old Testament, the commandments. Jesus has broken down that wall of hostility, verse 15, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances so that He could create in Himself one new man in place of the two. Judaism is not on its own crash course into the future where God is going to do something special with them. He says, no, Jesus Christ has torn down and abolished that old law, Judaism, and now in Jesus Christ, the two things, the old wineskin and the new wineskin, right? 
the old piece of clothing and the new piece of clothing. He's gotten rid of those two ideas of something old and something new, and he has made one man out of the two. In order to do this, he clearly has to get rid of the first covenant in order to establish his second covenant. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 8 and following. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these were offered according to the law. He then added, behold, I have come to do your will. Let me pause right there. He said all the things in the law, God never enjoyed them. The sacrifices, the rituals, the, the, the different aspects. He said, I did not take pleasure in that stuff. I did not, I was not pleased with that because those things can never really take away sin and those things can never make a person righteous. Those were just the beginnings. Those were the infancy state of me revealing my plan to you and I was never really pleased with those things. But in verse 9, somebody pops up and says, Behold, I have come to do your will. You notice all the way from the first pages of Genesis, God has been promising somebody is going to come. An individual is going to come and he is going to fix everything. And here we see him. I have come to do your will. What did he do for us? Uh, verse 9, Behold, I have come to do your will. So he does away with the first in order to establish the second. Verse 10, And by that will we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once and for all. What the first covenant could never do, Jesus has now accomplished once and for all. Verse 4, and this is one of the most powerful. Again, this is going back into what is called futurism. That God still has a plan in the future for Israel. That God still has aspects of the Old Testament that need to be completed in the future. Hopefully you're already convinced and trained enough to know that that can't be true. But there is still this idea that there is still more that needs to happen in the future for Israel, but we are going to redefine who Abraham's real children are and who the heir of the promises are. Pay close attention to this one. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26. This is now the full-grown eschatologic completion of God's plan. Now that Jews and Gentiles both lose their identity and they both become one new man through Jesus. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ so there is neither a Jew nor a Greek. There's no slave, there's no free, there's no male, there's no female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And here it is, guys. Verse 29, If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring. You are Abraham's descendants. If you have been baptized into Christ, you are Abraham's children and you are the heirs of the promises. You are the heirs according to the promise. I hope it's clear there that he has just redefined who Abraham's real children are. He has just redefined who Abraham's descendants are, and he has just redefined 
who is to receive, who are the heirs that are to receive God's promises. Anyone who has been baptized into Christ and has put on Christ is now Abraham's offspring. The caterpillar doesn't exist anymore. It's now morphed into a butterfly. It looks completely different. It's not that the old one was wrong. It's not that the old one had to be changed because it didn't work and now we have a plan B. It's that the old one was a school teacher. It was the babysitter. It was the nanny, so to speak. It was the tutor is what the Bible says. The old way was a tutor to babysit God's eschatologic plan way back here during its infancy. But now as God's, uh, Paul will tell us, uh, Romans chapter 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. In it is revealed the righteousness of God. What that means is the gospel reveals God's plan. The gospel reveals God's goodness to mankind. The gospel is what teaches us that. And so there's no room for the old thing anymore because there is a new definition. Now that God's plan has matured, now that God's plan has reached its goal, here is the new conclusion. Those that have been baptized into Christ are the new offspring of Abraham and the new heirs according to the promise. There is nothing waiting in Jerusalem or a temple for the Jews outside of accepting Jesus Christ. So we go back to answer our opening statement in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus was saying during His life, during his generation, the law and the prophets still needed to be fulfilled. Not one, dot, not one dot iota of the law would disappear until everything was fulfilled. And it would be wrong to relax any of the commandments. Can you see how if you read that without understanding everything I've just shared with you, Somebody might walk away from Jesus' teaching and go, see guys, we still got to obey the commandments. We still got to be under the law. But in Jesus' day, he's saying, no, in his time, it still needs to be fulfilled. Nothing will disappear from the law until all is accomplished. But all the texts that we have read up to this point have told us that Jesus was the fulfillment of all of those things. The law was a school teacher to guide us to be a guardian until faith in Christ came. And now that faith in Christ is here, we are no longer under that old guardian. Jesus, by His death, burial, and resurrection, fulfilled and accomplished everything that the law and the prophets and the Psalms required. Jesus himself is going to tell us this. I'll give you this last verse, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verse 44. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus has already died, been buried. He's already been resurrected. And now the resurrected Jesus is about to tell his disciples you don't understand. I, everything that just happened to me needed to happen in order to fulfill the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And he's going to teach them at his resurrection that it's all done, it's all been completed, it's all been fulfilled. Luke chapter 24 and verse 44. And Jesus said to them, These are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. So then he opened their mind to understand the Scriptures. They didn't understand why Jesus had to die, 
why Jesus had to be tortured and suffer, why Jesus was buried, and now they couldn't believe that He was resurrected, and Jesus has to teach them from the Scriptures all of these things that I underwent are the fulfillment of everything that was said in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. I think it would be very valuable for you to take this section, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, where Jesus says things still need to be fulfilled. The law doesn't disappear until everything is accomplished. It would be wrong to relax any of the commandments. And right there in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, make a cross-reference over to Luke 24, 44 through 45. Because it's there after His resurrection that Jesus says, okay, I did it. It is finished. Everything has been accomplished. Everything has been fulfilled. Therefore, there is no longer any need for that old guardian. Okay, let's put a pen right there, guys. Uh, there is a lot of discontinuity in many of our Protestant religions because they don't understand the things that you have just been taught. I hope you'll make note of those and equip yourself. Uh, so now we're clear about that text. Um, next time we meet together or next time I preach, I'll give you part two, which is when we actually look at Jesus' words and the fact that He says, you have to be more righteous than the Pharisees or you'll never be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. That'll be part two of this. Uh, let me pray, and then we'll sing. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. Father, there are so many that are lost. There are so many that are misled. That are, there are so many that are just basing their entire belief on one memory verse. Father, it took some work for us to work our way through the pages of Your holy text. The revelation that has come to us from Jesus through the apostles and written down these things that have come down out of heaven. And it took quite a bit of work, Father, to see the entirety of your eschatologic plan. Father, I believe that there are many that have been misled because they're not shown the entirety of your plan. They're just shown single memory verses here and there. They're being misled. They're being led astray. The blind are leading the blind and they're both falling into the pit. Father, I pray that we can be equipped to take your message to the world, that people might hear this message and recognize your truth. It's these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen.